Today is the 14th of May, and this date is an anniversary. 72 years ago, on this exact date, 14th May 1948, the State of Israel was born in very difficult circumstances. It was not clear at all that the new state would survive, not just because of the war, but to even be able to feed its 800,000 citizens and the millions of refugees flooding from Europe and the neighboring countries. It was much less likely that it would eventually become an affluent country of 9 million citizens. The unparalleled success can be attributed to many factors and quite crucially to its technological achievements. From water management to agricultural innovation to having the highest per capita startups in the world, a lot of these amazing achievements were born at the Technion, Israel's major technology institution. So especially today, I'm delighted to host one of the brightest scientists of the Technion, Joshua Schnittman. In the coronavirus era, I hope it won't be an era, let's be optimistic, uh, let's call it uh, coronavirus year. There are plenty of webinars on the topic, everyone is trying to be in the news. These days, it seems everyone is becoming an expert in COVID-19, including uh, some of my friends in uh, banking and property market who seem to be on the way to become doctors. But only few scientists had already been working on relevant technologies, even before the whole thing started. Joseph Schnittman is one of these few. His work is not a reaction to COVID-19. He's been working on this for years. Today, we will listen to his fascinating journey and learn about new tools to fight this global challenge. Along with quite a few other responsibilities, Joswell heads the Biofluids Laboratory at the Technion Faculty of Biomedical Engineering. Born in France, inspired by his parents in theoretical maths and architecture, Joswell's interest in technology started early on. He studied at MIT, went on to earn a PhD at ETH, the famous Swiss University where Albert Einstein attended and taught. He then moved on to UPenn and Princeton, all very famous institutions, from where in 2010, the Technion succeeded to attract him and where he has stayed ever since. A few years ago, Joshua decided to focus his research into saving lives by improving the chances of patients with acute respiratory distress syndrome, ARDS, a condition that requires assisted ventilation in intensive care units, and which prognosis is really poor. This is the exact same cause that puts COVID-19 patients in ICUs and in peril. So it's quite amazing that already now we have such relevant technology at our disposal to fight COVID-19. Technology is under testing, of course, but it was patented already in 2017, and a new company was recently established to commercialize it. So this is not an abstract research project. So without further ado, I'm handing over to Jose Schnittman. Thank you very much and don't forget your questions. Good evening, David. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for hosting me and inviting me. It's an honor, it's a pleasure. Um, I, I never thought I'd, I'd be on the front line. I certainly don't consider myself such a shining star at the Technion, but somehow the timing um, happened to be fortuitous for the research that had initiated. Um, this summer marks the 10th anniversary uh, since I made Aliyah, uh, and uh, my children were born that following year in 2011, and I have one over there who's playing PlayStation but he told me he's a little bit shy, so he doesn't want to come in front of the screen, but he may pop his head at some point. <laughs> he, he confirms. Um, a lot of people have asked me how on earth I ended up at the Technion. Um, the story is anecdotal, but perhaps it, 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 it tells the story of kind of the mix of a wandering Jew and the scientist, uh, uh, seeking, seeking in essence, uh, the ach achieving a, a career. But uh, I really came to Israel to join the Technion. Uh, and oftentimes I'm asked, uh, why is it that I'm in Israel? And I say, actually, I came for a job, which is a very uncommon answer. 
But uh, here it is, and it's a decade since I've moved here, and I've been uh, at the Technion, and my background is curious in the sense that I was not predisposed by any means to end up having a career in the field of uh, pulmonary physiology, uh, drug delivery to the lungs. You see, my, my, my childhood dream um, um, was to found a, a race car company. And you're wondering what on earth does that have to do with anything? But the truth is, is that in race cars, shapes have a lot of meaning and the beauty of you know, Ferraris and whatnot uh, are the answer of a function that embodies itself in a shape and that has to do with aerodynamics. And aerodynamics is the physics or the science of how uh, fluids, may they be gas like air or liquids, flow. And so lo and behold, a few hiccups along the way, um, to make a long story short, I decided in a very pragmatic fashion to take my curiosity for uh, aerodynamics and, and fluid mechanics and everything to do with flow physics into something that was more related to uh, medicine. And I found myself at a fork, which was where to go. And there were in essence two main choices. One, which is in fact the much more common avenue, which is cardiovascular flows everything to do with blood flow. But I, I thought I'd have zero chance to make an impact there because I was not linked to any lab that had any kind of big players in the field. And, and it's a, in many ways a saturated field that I kind of uh, picked the other road and went for the lungs. And in the lungs, as you understand, you breathe air. And if you breathe air, in essence, you're moving, you're moving a fluid, which is a gas in this case. And so what turns out to be that anecdotal choice, which was really not out of love, but out of curiosity and pragmatism, well, lo and behold, I made a career out of it and I love it. So how does this all tie in with COVID-19? As David mentioned a few years back, we started work in what was a disease or a syndrome, shall I say, that uh, is actually not really on the radar screen. And that is called a RDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. Now it is a syndrome, it is not a disease. And what it means is that it's a condition. It's a terrible condition. And one of the ways to get a RDS is uh, for instance, suffering uh, a car crash, drowning, uh, inhaling fumes from a fire or pneumonia that goes completely uh, uh, wild. What happens is that the lungs, the organ, shut down for a number of reasons. May it be a tremendous inflammation with the immune system that is basically just flooding uh, immune cells into the lungs because there's a call for them. But, but the body is something that's extremely complex, very, very complicated biology, which by no means do we fully understand. But the end result, is that a lot of things start to go funky and stop working. And in the case of the lungs, you have to imagine that in the case of ARDS, which is a syndrome that we are witnessing in some sorts for the severe patients that suffer from COVID-19, is this organ failure. So what we need to understand here is that by the time you hit uh, the ICU <clears throat> and require uh, assisted ventilation, in other words, mechanical ventilation, in other words, intubation, in other words, potentially uh, full anesthesia, then believe me, you're really uh, between life and death. And people who suffer from ARDS or an analogous version of that syndrome, as in the case of COVID-19, because of course, the symptoms are so vast, but nevertheless, uh, the prognostic, as David mentioned, is horrible. It's a flip of a coin. And it has many reasons, some of which are because we just don't know how to deal with it. The other thing is we basically don't have therapeutics on hands. And our strategy is to buy ourselves some time with the ventilator that basically does the heavy lifting of breathing and delivering oxygen. 
But that in itself, one needs to understand, is again, not a therapy. It's basically hoping for the best with what we have. Okay, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, what you need to understand is the business I got myself into is not directly curing uh, COVID-19. In other words, the coronavirus, which has the name SARS-CoV-2, but rather we're talking about the rescue therapy to get people off the ventilator eventually have lungs that function sufficiently enough, okay, that the body itself can go back to tackling all the other issues. But once you have lung failure, which is a first organ failure, lo and behold, there are obviously chances you're going to have other organ failures, which is another cause. Okay, so if we understand more or less the big picture, but we don't get all the details because we ourselves don't get them either, then where can we try and do something? Now, in the case of ARDS, it so happens, which is very bizarre, it so happens that it has a sister syndrome that, um, that affects the world of prematures. And that is called IRDS, Infant Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It's not new. Uh, we've known IRDS as well as ARDS for 50 plus years. But actually in the world of IRDS, our rescue therapy has a near 100% yield, which is crazy. And in fact, one doesn't speak so much about IRDS in terms of saving the babies because we do it so well. Having said that, it does not mean it's an easy treatment. It is in fact uh, an invasive treatment, but it works. And what works there is that um, not unlike in ARDS, which is a lung failure, when babies are born prematurely, you can imagine they weren't intended to be in the outside world so soon. Okay, so a lot of their functions are not mature. And one of them, one important one, which is why from a pure mechanical perspective, one cannot breathe, is that the inside surface of our lungs are covered with a liquid called surfactant. Now, surfactant is a very complex fluid. We don't understand everything. It has immune functions. It has protective function. It, has, it, it creates signals. But one very basic underlying function of surfactant, and that is at the basis of all breathing, is that like soap, it has the tendency to reduce what is called surface tension. And surface tension is a, an energy barrier that makes things difficult to move. Now, when you use soap as a detergent, it does exactly that. Because when you try to put water and get into the crevices of your clothes, water just can't infiltrate. And that has to do that the surface tension is so high. It just does not want to go in. But when you add something like a surfactant, which is somewhat like a soap, then it helps alleviate that energy. So it makes it easier to access the different surfaces. What does it mean in practice? It means that if you have surfactant, your muscles are sufficiently strong to breathe and pull on your lungs. That's what your diaphragm muscles do. People who have a lack of surfactant, in practice, what happens is they're not strong enough to breathe on their own, and thus mechanical ventilation. Okay, so we, we understand that one aspect of ARDS deals with this lack of surfactant. It's certainly what's happening in the children, in the prematures. This is what's life-saving. If you put back surfactant in the lungs of babies, then actually, one, you alleviate the, the effort of breathing and so they can breathe on their own. And two, by some magic trick that we don't understand, amongst other biology is so complex, but it triggers somehow those cells to start producing that surfactant, the lung cells. So, why is it that a therapy such as delivering surfactant, and again, this surfactant is taken, for instance, from animals. So it's taken from uh, sheep and mostly cows, and it is injected via the trachea because these babies need to be intubated on that moment and squirted down into the lungs of the babies. But this has never, ever, ever worked in adults. 
it's 30 years that we're trying to find something that can save people out of ARDS, and we just don't have it. So at the Technion, I'm surrounded by people, fortunately, who are a lot, lot smarter than I am. Uh, and that's a very good thing. So I don't have to rely on myself because we wouldn't be here. I certainly would not be invited uh, at this table or at this um, Zoom webinar tonight were it not for the people who I represent. But one person, uh, his name is Dr. Janusz Kowski, who's actually leading now Nishima and is leading what I'm about to tell you in terms of the experiments in animals, thought, well, maybe the hypothesis for why it doesn't work in adults has to do also from a mechanical uh, uh, perspective, which is when you squirt in a liquid, a liquid will always want to follow the direction of where it's the easiest to flow. Now, when you flow a liquid, it wants to follow gravity. So it will just literally fall like a pool. Okay. But when the lungs of a premature are basically the size of the tip of my finger, you can imagine that in such tiny lungs, that effect is not so severely felt. Now you see, I'm not a particularly big person, but you see the tip of my finger, and now you see the size of my entire chest. Now, of course, squirting that liquid into my lungs via the trachea is not going to disperse through uh, the lungs. And the lungs are a very, very complex tree. Okay. So the thing is, maybe the therapy has a shot, in other words, delivering surfactant, but maybe the delivery method is not the most suited. So I'm not a pharmacologist. My lab is not focused on, on, on inventing therapies, but they, we, we are active in terms of the drug delivery part, which is if you have something of interest to deliver to the lungs, what would be a good way to do that? And precisely, our, 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 our delivery method here is an embodiment of the biomedical engineering aspect. So what's lighter than a liquid? Well, and what works well with surfactant, which is a soap? Bubbles, right? I mean, you don't need to be a genius, right? Because we've all had some kind of intuition with things like foamy soaps and bubbles. They're kind of light. And, and that's the whole point because they have low surface tension and they easily make little bubbles. And so Jan uh, thought, why not take surfactant, foam it, so that the same amount of liquid would suddenly be embodied or encapsulated in plenty of foam with a lot of air, and thus deliver the foam instead of the liquid. And so that's precisely what we started doing. Bear in mind, we were pre-COVID-19 in this whole story. There was nothing to do with the coronavirus. But in essence, supported by uh, uh, the Polak Fund through the ATS in the United States, this was three years ago already, three plus years ago. And then uh, the European Union through uh, the European Research Council, which uh, of late has managed to raise about several billions now that have been pledged in this fight against COVID-19, uh, we went on to do the first experiments in rats to show that we can have safety and efficacy for ARDS models in these animals, which is the way you go forward uh, in the scientific community on established animal models. Lo and behold, we managed to do that. In other words, we showed that against the traditional liquid uh, squirting inside the lungs, the foam did as well, if not even a bit better. But I know you're, you're probably dying to tell me, but they're rats. They're the size, basically, of my finger. And you're absolutely right. So as I speak, here we are. In January, February, suddenly, we were going to be fast-tracked because we were one of the few labs that had, from day one, uh, authorization to push forward. And with the support of the vice president, uh, Professor Kobe Rubinstein, he said, go, 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 let's get a move on with this. And then the Ministry of Science and Technology gave us a, just a month ago a proof, uh, their stamp of approval to move forward with these experiments in rats and do them on pigs. Because adult pigs have basically the same sizes of lungs as we do. 
It's not a perfect fit. Of course, every anatomy is different, but it is a lot closer to the human because of course, as you understand, you cannot jump from an rat experiment and move directly, even as a compassionate treatment for the worst case scenarios, you just cannot jump the horse. And so as we speak, um, we are about, we are finishing the protocols to do the first experiments in pigs at the Faculty of Medicine, at the, which is uh, near Rambam in the, uh, on the Technion campus, and try and prove that actually foam surfactant has a chance to be a rescue therapy that works, that is safe in lungs that are as big as ours, okay? Uh, and have a check mark at the level of the, what we call preclinical animal experiments. If this pans out, if, and of course it's a big if, and I need to keep my, sign, uh, my, my hat of a scientist because one cannot mislead, but if this turns out to be successful, then there is a real chance that this liquid foam therapy has a shot as moving on as a rescue therapy for people who are already in dire critical situations under a ventilator and basically have no other hope than just oxygenation at this stage. And this is, as I speak to you this evening, this is where we stand. Um, the timeline is hoping for the best that over the next few months, we will come back to the table with positive uh, uh, results from the preclinical pig experiments. So let, let me stop for now at that. But uh, if we can crack the so-called ARDS problem, it gives a chance to patients to start tackling the coronavirus part, which the body needs to tackle. So without helping the lungs out, there's very little chance we can do anything for the rest of the body. Okay, thank you, Josue. This is not the first time I've heard uh, this, the, this description. Believe me, it's always interesting and I'm not flattering you here, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we have a few questions um, and you know, the main thing here uh, is about the foam itself. Uh, there is a, uh, two, two questions on that. Uh, what is it made from, uh, yeah, the yeah. basic constituents? And a more technical one by, by a lone wolf um, who is asking, do you optimize it? Do you, all the features, do you optimize it for the size of the bubbles? Uh, do you optimize it for the anatomy of the patient and the size? So I'll, I'll try and tackle both questions. Um, it turns out that the patent itself of liquid foam therapy is generic, generic excuse me, enough that it was conceived as a drug delivery system. In other words, it is not bounded to surfactant delivery. It is a means, for instance, as aerosol therapy, as liquid installation to just deliver therapeutics. In the specific case of ARDS, where our first and principal line of therapeutic lines of surfactant, actually the beauty of it, and this is what we had already shown in rats, is that you just foam directly the surfactant. So that's the first thing. So there's no other active ingredient and there is no other bio inert ingredient that needs to be added. It's purely the surfactant, the liquid surfactant that is foamed. And I'll say a word about the foaming process in a, in a moment. More generally, there are many uh, uh, diseases of the lungs where there would be tremendous advantages of piggybacking on the foam and lodging therapeutics inside the foam to deliver in a very homogeneous and widespread for, for various diseases. Uh, uh, you can think of fibrosis, you can think of, of, uh, of um, severe cases of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and so on and so forth. And the idea there is to use a bioinert compound, which is already 
approved and, for instance, FDA approved, and then lodge the therapeutics. But in the case of ARDS, uh, we're going along the route that we just foam directly the surfactant. And in terms of foaming, um, we, it's not a serendipitous choice of what's the bubble size. We basically aim to make bubbles that are smaller than the alveolar structures of the lungs so that the bubbles are small enough uh, uh, to basically populate inside the last small alveolar structures. So we are talking about bubbles that are way under uh, something 200 microns, so 0.2 millimeter or 0.1 millimeter. Um, and the technique is extremely versatile in that sense. If the carrier or the surfactant has the ability to be foamed, you got it and that works. And, and that's, that's the necessary uh, condition that you need. Excellent. Uh, we have a few questions more. Um, there is a, another disease called chronic obstructive lung illness. Uh, our participant Redner is asking, could this be that this technology could be helpful for that disease, if you're, if you're familiar with that? Yes. So I mentioned, I, I don't know if uh, our, our uh, participant was actually meaning chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, if that indeed is what uh, our participant was alluding to, absolutely. So uh, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, unfortunately has also no therapy. And it's one of the leading causes of death worldwide, in particular for, for more advanced uh, age groups. Uh, and um, one of the things that has potential in the long run with the company Nishima is to basically use potential therapeutics, load them, and deliver them via this foam into the lungs. May they be steroids? May they be other active ingredients? There's also, for instance, the field of delivering lung stem cells and giving a chance for regeneration. This is very, very much, as I'm speaking, a final frontier. But nevertheless, there are preliminary studies that show that you can have positive effects by bringing stem cells into the lungs to regenerate the lungs. So there's a whole wide uh, 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 avenue of potential uh, uh, ramifications and developments where the lift technology, in other words, liquid foam therapy has potential use. Um, yes, I believe that answers somewhat the question. Oh, definitely. Uh, there, another question is just statistically, how many, apart from COVID-19, of course, how many people in the world suffer uh, from ARDS, from our friend Dory Levis? Absolutely. That's a fantastic question. As uh, uh, Until late February, most people would never have come across our kind of research. It turns out that ARDS, for instance, uh, in the United States affects give or take 200,000 patients. So it's under the radar screen. Uh, it's what you call actually something of a orphan disease because these are relatively small population, but it has a twist. And the twist is because the mortality rate hovers near the 50% and people are in the ICU for weeks, the costs associated with ARDS for that small population of say 200,000 in the United States where of course, the medical costs are notorious, hovers around $13 billion for that small population. So you see that there's a real incentive, okay, to have a rescue therapy for ARDS to minimize or reduce significantly the hospitalization duration. So it's a small disease, uh, it's, a, it's a small population, but it has tremendous burden on the medical system because as we've seen we have lacks of ventilators so suddenly what was something where we didn't need on national scales so many ventilators for instance ARDS in the normal sense suddenly can be detrimental because we're completely overwhelmed by the need for these when in fact under normal circumstances or in the old world 
uh, we didn't need that many on a compared to the size of our population. But the situation has changed now. Michael Dangur is asking, how early can this uh, liquid foam therapy be administered? Uh, can early administration prevent it? Wow, so the prevention, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't know, we're, we're not as ambitious at this stage to think about the prevention. In general, there are lung function metrics that give us a sense of how low the oxygenation levels are, which means that the lungs are not functional, sufficiently functional, is the time when you should kick in uh, this lift delivery. Um, that's at the stage still intended. The surfactant delivery is not yet intended as a prevention. It's an excellent question. Uh, with the current timeline, because we're trying to move as fast as we can, we, we can't explore it yet, just yet, that avenue. But that is an excellent point. Okay, another participant is asking, uh, does the bubble carry med the medication inside of it or on its surface of, of, the, of the actual uh, bubble? And what happens to the bubble once it's in the lung? lung? Does it disappear? So I'll answer first the, the latter question and I'll come back to the first. In essence, as, uh, and I'm speaking mostly to the, the UK crowd, so I guess you're familiar with beer, but not unlike beer, at some point the foam settles. There's a trick here to have a foamed surfactant that relatively quickly, we're talking about within a minute or so, under two minutes, certainly under five, returns from a state of foam to a liquid. So yes, it destructures itself back into a liquid form. In terms of the carrier concept, and that's an excellent question, in the case of surfactant foam, which is directly foaming the surfactant, well, in fact, the surfactant is caught on the surfaces of those bubbles. But, and that's a very good point, and I guess this is what uh, our, our participant is, is, is uh, thinking about, I guess, is yes, uh, depending on what material you can lodge inside the space, uh, inside the bubbles, other sorts, particulate matter, uh, stem cells, uh, all sorts of active molecules that could be lodged within, true. It is really intended, just think of it this way. We think of taking aerosols for lung therapy, right? But aerosols typically have various Act various ingredients inside. They may be droplets that are li liquid, uh, liquid droplets that contain all sorts of things. And, and in the same sense, lift is, is exactly that. It is a carrier and it has an ability to carry various ingredients. Okay, a couple of other more questions that are coming and it's great. Uh, efficiency. Uh, what is the lung efficiency if we can measure it somehow? So um, what we've done for the time being, so the efficiency as we measure it, you can see it from a very kind of a physiological point of view, just like when you go to the doctor and they measure your heart rate and, and they would measure your level of oxygenation and so on and so forth. So the efficiency of the therapy is measured directly via the outcome of are the lungs oxygenated? In other words, do we recover uh, from the blood measurement the oxygenation that is needed? And that's a very straightforward. Then there's the next level of efficiency is how well did we deliver? And this we have already insight because what we've done is before trying the pigs, we took pig lungs, so they are excised. So what you call an ex vivo experiment and we injected foam using our therapy, our, our, our delivery mechanism, and using dye, and then basically doing histological cuts to see where the foam went across the lungs. And without giving you a hard number, what I can tell you is when you visually look at this compared to what happens when you just squirt a liquid inside lungs of our human size, adult size, then the lift is tremendously potent because it reaches really everywhere or almost 
everywhere inside the lungs. And so there's the efficiency of the delivery and then there's the efficiency of the therapy. It's a very good point. Uh, question about the procedure itself. Does the patient need to be under full anesthesia and intubated for installation? I think I know the answer, unfortunately. Uh, for, or could the form be just inhaled? Okay, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's a very, very good question. In principle, in principle, it does not need to be under full anesthesia. You do need to have a complacent patient uh, who will be basically primed in the sense of explain what is going to happen. In the case of the rescue therapy, as David said, for ARDS, as it stands now, COVID-19 induced ARDS-like uh, uh, syndrome, then we are talking, unfortunately, already about fully anesthetized patients who are intubated, who are receiving mechanical ventilation, and in essence, on the intubation line, you insert the foam, uh, people often have the counter in, intuition that they would be drowned, but actually it's not that much volume of foam and you ventilate the patient anyway with oxygen behind. So imagine this slug of foam that's basically going through the line and behind it, you ventilate the patient anyway. But in the first rescue therapy embodiment, it is certainly intended for people who are already in the most critical situation. Gillian is asking, what is the duration of this delivery treatment? Is it like one shot or is it continuous, I suppose? So it's actually intended very much in the sense of a one shot. In IRDS for the babies, it's very rare to do more than one or two uh, uh, aliquots delivery. What we've done in the rats, it was based on one administ administration of one volume of it. And, and the protocols that we are working on for the pigs, we are nevertheless, even if it's two shot, the entire duration of the delivery is basically a minute. You know, it's a very, very quick maneuver. It's not something that you receive every second, five hour, 10 hour. It's not at all how surfactant delivery is intended uh, uh, to relief. It's, an, it's intended to be an immediate relief within the first hour, half hour, to the first hour, to the second hour. Maybe if need be, there would be a second administration after 24 hours, but this is something we do not know yet if it's actually needed. So this is something we'll have to troubleshoot down the line. But it is a one, it's intended basically in its concept as a pseudo one-shot therapy. Okay, Gillian is actually asking a kind of a follow-up question uh, to that, uh, whether the reports of patients being placed on their stomachs, uh, what, what, does, what does it do to the efficacy of the treatment? treatment? Okay, so let me try and answer to the best of my knowledge. Um, the lungs are a very awkward, complicated, sponges uh, system. It's certainly not, don't think of it as a balloon, think of it literally as a sponge. And so because of the various positioning, uh, uh, some parts are not recruited, they're collapsed, they're pressed on, it makes it very complicated. Uh, during, during the administration of lift, it is nevertheless intended for a one position delivery and, and our protocols are not looking into doing rotational movements and so on and so forth. Now, now for, 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 for uh, prematures, actually that's kind of what they do. They, they hold them and rotate, you know, kind of twist them all around to disperse more homogeneously the liquid. Okay, I mean, there are a couple of technical questions and I suppose we have some slides that you will show, uh, you know, you have to show us, but question is, I mean, I, I don't even sure I'm, I'm reading it right. Do you close a control loop for the production of the foam and drug use dosage to the physiological measures of the patient? This absolutely. is a very technical question. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yes, the answer is yes, yes, yes. The way it works, is these are typically administrations of surfactant that are based on volumes, milliliter per kilogram of the patient. 
The device, the prototype that we have constructed is intended to be, as the, as the participant said, a closed loop system. It pre-foams the amount of, of surfactant that is required for the specific patient. And that and only that volume that ensues from the foaming process is administered. So yes, yes, it is a closed loop system. It is controlled for the patient based on the guidelines. Elliot is asking uh, again some technical question. It is going off the foam treatment. Does vitamin C onto the muscle is valid as a treatment? Again, this is getting into so, different things, but right. Um, I, the the my my sh my short answer is I don't know. I'm not a specialist. I'm not yeah. a I'm, I'm not an MD. I've heard all sorts of discussions going on on what to give, what not to give, various vitamins and so on. Um, perhaps the, the participant is more knowledgeable in this. I will say this, I've seen in all the scientific readings that I've seen to the time being, it is extremely speculative of what helps and what not. And they've gone about to write lists of what we do and don't know, and, and that ideas are being tossed around all over. So it's important to be very cautious here. Okay, I mean, talking a bit, another question here, uh, which is relates to your kind of background in aerodynamics. Uh, the question is, what kind of flow do you have uh, for the foam? Is there turbulence involved? No, I would imagine it's very, very, very soft. But... No, it's uh, basically, imagine seeing a snake that's moving, kind of creeping its way. So it's this kind of blob, this slug that's passing through. And the thing is, foam is fantastic in the sense that it, it, really, it really doesn't see any barriers. It just goes wherever it can. It flows with a lot of easiness. So I'll take the opportunity just to give you a feeler. I don't wanna uh, bore the audience too much, but to give a sense so that they see in movie what we're talking about on example. So I'm gonna take the liberty of sharing my screen for a short moment and I will show you. So. These are three-dimensional oh, models. Just, just to explain that, uh, that this takes over all the screen of, okay. uh, of the computer. So anybody yes. that wants to have a smaller screen can go into view options and do exit full screen, just if it confuses them. So please, Joseph. Right, so I, I'm not here to bore people with, with uh, technical details. I just want to leave them with an impression of a general understanding. What you're seeing here is the uh, model a full scale model of the upper airways. The top part is the trachea, and these are the first bifurcations of the lungs. If you pour a liquid like surfactant, okay, then what it does, of course, is that it's gonna flow where gravity points. And we don't need to be Albert Einstein or rocket scientists to understand that. So it would mean that to do something efficiently, you'd have to rotate like on a barbecue, the patient in real time, to have a chance maybe to start accessing the various airways. If you do the same thing with foam, so this is the idea here, as you see. So you, you, you see that actually the foam exits all the airways, including those that are nearly at 180 degrees opposite of the direction of gravity. And so it tells you that when you're light enough as air, there's a ch chance you're gonna make your way in all the directions. Now I'm gonna show you something that looks a little bit comp uh, technical, but no need to fear. So these little bubbles here, these are small airway models. These are just a millimeter airway. And this is how bubbles just go, they go everywhere. The foam just enters, psh, there's no stopping it, okay? And if you wait long, another minute, it will come back to liquid. And this I will share with you. It looks a little bit overwhelming, but what you are seeing uh, in a slightly gruesome way is those cuts inside lungs of pigs that show you on the left-hand side the dye for the stained surfactant when it was foamed versus when you administer it in just liquid. And I think that most of us who are not colorblind can see that lift, the foam version, has this opportunity to go basically everywhere. And that's the bottom line 
of why lift is potentially so potent is that the foam accesses all the lungs, the entire sponge, and you're not missing out on entire portions with the liquid version. So I don't wanna take more time than that. And I don't wanna leave our last slide on a pig lung. So I will stop sharing that. But that's the essence of it. We it have a shot yeah. because of that. We do have, I mean, there is a lot of interest. And by the way, it really, it's really up to you. But, you know, as, as long as we have questions, at least at Technion UK will not stop this conference, but maybe, you know, people, you have to go. So uh, you have some research to do, I suppose. And, you well, know, I, so there's family. parenting as well, I suppose. <laughs> some parenting okay. as well, yeah. Uh, but basically, uh, there's a question is, uh, what about aerosols? What happens to the bubbles? Do they get absorbed? Uh, a practical question whether this whole presentation will be available. I can already say that it will be on YouTube, Myra. Uh, we'll, you can see the whole thing in YouTube again uh, soon. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the technical question about the bubbles. Okay. And then I have a question, the last sure. question. So, uh, the bubbles, that goes back to the question, just like the beer, the foam on the beer, the idea is that the bubbles will return to a liquid state. Guys, don't forget, that at the end of the day, what looks like a large volume is mostly air. And actually what you're administering is maybe only 200 milliliters of liquid on a surface that's 100 square meters. So it's a very thin layer all over. So actually it returns to a liquid state and indeed it is absorbed because it is surfactant. And so it's, it's meant to do the job on the surface of the lungs. With regards to aerosols, and there have been studies along this path, the problem with aerosols is multifold, but I will highlight two problems that are well known. One, aerosols are very poor at going into places that are hard to access. I've spent most of my career in the world of aerosols, and the problem is, is that it's terrible at doing drug targeting. In other words, you need so much aerosol to deliver efficiency, efficiently. And the other thing that works against it is that aerosols are incapable of delivering 200 milliliters of a dose in the case of the RTS. Yeah. It would take a day to deliver this nonstop if you were on a nebulizer. Just to explain, aerosols is probably uh, something like an inhaler, right? That's Correct. That's, a yeah. nebulizer so with know. a mask, yeah. which would be continuous. Think that a nebulizer with a mask, you're talking about a, mil, a few milliliters per hour. So it's unfeasible and it has terrible deposition efficiency. These treatments are very expensive. There's not even so much surfactant on planet Earth available. So, okay. so, so there's a real problem of the efficiency of the delivery here. So unfortunately, aerosols are not an option for, for high yield. Joseph, one final question, so we'll let you go back to your yeah. research and your parenting. Uh, who are the, I mean, it seems quite amazing that we have all that, and I think we could even continue for hours to discuss it. Uh, who are the other players around the world? What is the kind of, are, are other people doing this thing on this specific, of course, part of the solution? And can you say something about the Technion and your experience compared to, you've been to MIT, you've been to ETH, you know, really famous, huge places, uh, legendary places. Can you say a few things about how yeah. research works at the, the Technion? I'll be happy to, to, to give some concluding comments on that, on, on the more personal aspect. <clears throat> so obviously we're, we are by no means alone uh, in trying to, to crack solutions for the specific part of the ARDS and more generally for COVID-19. The thing is, is that when it comes to the delivery method, because the surfactant is not something new, it's approved, it's FDA approved, it's approved across Europe. So we're not inventing the therapeutic, it's the delivery method. And, and there, uh, uh, to my greatest honor, uh, uh, and, and, and stepping on the, on, on, on the shoulders of, of, of my lab, the, 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 the ingenuity came from the delivery method. And to the best of our knowledge, to the best of our knowledge, there is no other group on Mother Earth that has ever thought of doing 
therapies to the lungs using foams. Foams exist in other medical applications for uh, ears, for uh, veins, but it was completely wild to think about in the lungs. So, so that, that's, that's our add-on here in, in, in breaking the traditional mold of therapeutic delivery to the lungs. Now, with regards to the Technion, um, David can obviously uh, concur and, and relate. I'm a, I'm a French-born Swiss citizen who happens to have a somewhat American accent when he speaks in English. I'm kind of that bizarre hybrid person that uh, roams around the globe. Um, I think seen with the eyes of somewhat a foreigner, even after 10 years here, uh, something that has struck me and, and, and uh, really fulfilled me at the same time is that in Israel, because of the history, and, and David mentioned the, the not the, 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 let's say, bumpy history that a country has, has had to face, uh, people are extremely resourceful. They are in June, in, in, ingenious, they are novel, they understand the concept of bootstrapping, they understand the concept of, of making things work when resources are scarce, and this is something that you don't find so naturally in other leading institutions on our planet. In other words, there is an appetite and a fire and, and a lack of fear uh, that is second to none. And in many ways, I've benefited from that because people have come up, including Lyft, if I may, with crazy ideas that break molds. They break from the state of the art and from the gold standards uh, because they're out there and, and sometimes you don't need all that much to think of something that's really, really uh, 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 has the potential to really do a, a, a game changer, to deliver a game changer. And a place like the Technion nurtures that because it's based on a culture that was born and bred with that. And I see it very much with external eyes because I did not grow up in this environment. I came to Israel, I was uh, basically 30 years old. So I didn't go to school here. I didn't speak particularly well Hebrew. Um, so I've seen it from the sides and it's something that I find that is absolutely remarkable. And it is by, by all means one of the biggest strengths of the institution. It's quite amazing. I mean, I think this kind of research, this kind of attitude and you know, the way you describe it deserves all our support and hopefully, you know, donors will be continuing to support the Technion so it will need less resources than, 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 than it needs now. It will have as much as MIT or ETHA put together, hopefully. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Really, really, we appreciate it. As I said, we could stay on for hours. Thank you. Also, I want to thank all the participants. Do not hesitate to reach out to Technion UK. You have the link. Thank you for your participation. Uh, these are difficult times but for all of us, but especially for some that are sick, families that lost loved ones, countless others hit directly in many ways. But looking at such amazing developments and great research by the Technion and Joshua and other great universities around the world, one can only be optimistic. So I would like to close with a wish, as we always do, you know, in a kind of a Jewish way. Uh, next anniversary, we will have another Technion UK webinar. Describe Neshima, describe the treatments that put to get, start putting COVID-19 in the history books. Thank you all. Really, thank you. thank you. And have a great evening. Thanks very much. Thank you, David. Thank you.